This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, um, so then after imputing whole genome haplotypes with the PhD, I'm also going to compare it to Beagle as a common imputation software um, to see how it, how it holds up and compares. So first I started with uh, over 180 taxa from the HapMap2 in cassava. Um, these are, uh, these come from, this PCA just is from a paper a couple years ago by Ramu, uh, Puna et al. And um, it's just showing that there's a, definitely a lot of progenitors and cultivated types in here, but there's also some more diverse and wild um, in this hat map as well. I'm going to be starting with the cultivated and adding on just to see how that compares. And these reference ranges or haplotypes are defined um, using just the genic ranges plus a, a flanking KB on either side around 33,000 across the genome. Um, so then comes back to my question of how do we find haplotypes in something like sorghum amaze that's inbred, it might be, it's a little easier because you don't have to worry about sampling heterozygous uh, variants. Uh, but in our case with uh, cassava, which is a highly heterozygous or inbred crop, or sorry, it is a clonally propagated crop. Um, one can imagine three variants across a, a region uh, AC, I guess CC is a homozygous variant, we're okay there, but, and then a GT variant. Um, we could choose two haplotypes here, ACG and CCT, but that's, uh, you know, that's one option. The other option would be what we call another phase, which is ACT and CCG. This problem just gets harder and harder as you add more variants. There's, you know, a lot of, a lot of possibilities, many, many. Um, so how do we resolve the true phase? How do we because we need haplotypes in the database before we can do any imputation. So one way to look is if we can sample taxa that are homozygous at a range, we would know the true phase right there. I mean, I already said they're not homozygous, they're heterozygous, but if we do find some heter homozygous, we can know what the true haplotype phase is. And so because these are, uh, many are cultivated or you know, come from breeding programs, we expect there to be runs of homozygosity from um, years of selection and, and breeding efforts. So I went to go test that hypothesis, and this is what I found. So this is just a distribution of kind of number of heterozygous SNPs per genic range. And you can see, I mean, there's a kind of a, this, this, this spike and then this hump off the side, but I want to focus on the spike here is those haplotypes with near zero heterozygous SNPs. So, uh, it actually goes off the top. Um, it's just cut off, but that makes a, those make up around 20% of all of the haplotypes from these taxa. And if you take that 20% times about 180, all of them, you get over a million raw haplotypes um, that can then be put into the database. Uh, just I mean, I gotta, once again, not going to too far into it, but to simplify the search space, we will collapse some of these haplotypes based on similarity. So if some of them are, you know, only vary by a SNP or two or some small amounts of variation, they'll be collapsed to a consensus haplotype. Um, so next, I'm going to, I, I test some levels of imputation accuracy. Uh, so um, mainly how well do they do on major heterozygous and minor alleles? And I also looked at maybe expanding the database to something just out of the cultivated set. So the smallest red circle would just be just the cultivated and then I added the rest of the hat map and then even some more additional clones we have sequenced. And what I see here is that um, the smallest database actually did pretty well with the heterozygotes, but overall as we add, um, as we sample more haplotypes and, and get those into the database, the imputation accuracy is increasing um, in overall. Um, so next, not only do I want good, you know, good variant call accuracy, I'd also like to, to reproduce relationships because when we do genomic selection, we need to make sure that, you know, uh, we're, the, um, we're predicting true relationships. And so what I did next was compared, um, uh, compared the whole genome high depth, uh, relationship matrices made from whole genome high depth sequence uh, to the ones predicted by both Beagle and the PhD. So this is using 1x skim sequencing and imputing with these two methods. And I found that the PhD had a much higher, oh, I mean, as, it has a higher correlation for sure um, in, in these relationships that it's reproducing. Um, next step, which I have not performed yet, will be 
validating this, looking at phenotypes in a, in a, in a test set and comparing those. Uh, but in, for now, in conclusion, there are, um, there are enough homozygous, homo, homozygous regions across the HAP map that we can sample haplotypes uh, to store in our database and impute whole genome um, high quality relationships um, from them. Next, like I said, I'll be used, need to be looking for a good test set to test genomic predictions. Also, maybe uh, adding additional parameters to the to model that might be able to include maybe pedigree or relationships uh, for where to, uh, to where to impute haplotypes from, and then as well as maybe simulating real you know realish genotyping situations that a breeding program might use. And with that, I'd like to thank you and acknowledge all of. Uh, those that have helped, especially the programmers that work on the PhD, the other grad students that have helped, uh, my advisors, Kelly and Ed, and Guillaume at Cassava Base for uh, data help. And I'll take any questions. Time for a few questions. Yeah, Jean Luc. Thanks for the talk. That was great. Um, just easy one, I hope. The the graph showing predicted versus true. Where do you get the true relationship? Yeah, so that's I, I just used the like the thirty x like high depth um, high depth sequencing that I pulled from. Does that, so does that make sense? So I downsampled from high depth sequencing. I just made a relationship matrix from those, okay. and then I'm just comparing how the imputed uh, compare uh, the correlation between those relations and the ones imputed. So this is all on the on the, the one eighty. Yes, yes. None of the, yeah, all, none of the wilds. I, I kind of, in, I introduced, I may have built upon the database, but I'm only working on some of those cultivated uh, 180s. Yeah, Mike. You looked at like tracks of prediction accuracy across the, the genome to see if any like drops in accuracy may coincide with integration to wild species. Um, I, I, I have not done that yet. Uh, right now. I've been using just kind of one chromosome as a, uh, so I can iterate quickly and test quickly. I do know that there are some presence absence variation. Um, when I look across the haplotypes, there are some taxa that have almost no coverage, you know, on a few uh, haplotype ranges. So there's definitely some, maybe some presence absence issues, but uh, I have not looked at uh, the integration. I know that's a big deal with chromosome one, which I have not, is why I've been avoiding chromosome one. <laughs> sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, again. Uh, have you looked at the distribution of the rest of the across the chromosomes and how are they distributed? And how would that make the inference of heterozygote changing on the, uh, from, from your current data? Yeah, so I haven't looked at the spatial distribution. I have looked at like the distribution, how many. Some there are some haplotypes that are definitely less sampled than others because they are less. Let's say you know let's say if there's a lot of deleterious variants or something that need to be masked, it's not going to be homozygous very often. And so there are some haplotypes I've found that that I can't sample as deep from because there's not as many homozygotes. But I haven't looked at that spatially distributes across the chromosome. Our apologies to the people on Zoom. Uh, do you have any questions? Doesn't seem like it. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again, Evan. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.